Councillor Daly. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, although one might imagine that when welfare reform came onto the agenda uh, for the first time when the coalition government was, reform, uh, was formed uh, 18 months ago, that, that would pit the majority um, minority parties in this chamber at polar opposites. The underlying principles behind the government's proposals, both on benefit reform and on the reform of local authority funding, are not ones to which the minority party are fundamentally opposed. Both sides are in agreement that our welfare system is complex and does not always provide the right incentives for those that it does help. We may also agree that any welfare system should be designed to help people support themselves wherever possible and is failing if its design encourages people to rely on state help rather than stand independently. But designing a truly fair welfare state which provides incentives for those who can help themselves and longer term support for those who are unable to is a challenge that has beaten successive governments for the past 60 years. And while trying to meet this challenge by starting again from scratch is a laudable ambition, a solution will only be found by carefully piecing together a new model and taking the time to test its effectiveness. Although affordability is crucial and simplicity is highly desirable, the priority for those of us on this side of the chamber is that support is always available for all of those who genuinely need it. The current hasty proposals for welfare reform, however, do not meet this key objective. Instead, by prioritising simplicity above need, the Coalition is creating a system that, while being easier to understand, admittedly, will leave hundreds of thousands of people worse off, many of whom have no alternative but to rely on the state, contrary, contrary to Councillor Hallmark's uh, comments before. Single parents with disabled children with no choice but to take on the role of full-time carers. It's families like that that will see their income cut. Larger families who need help from the state to meet the rising cost of their rent. They will see their benefit cut and capped and have no choice to, put, to consider moving out of the borough in some cases. And in the most extreme cases, families will be made homeless by these changes. Well, still, Madam Mayor, these cuts are only the first blow that many of the families will have to sustain. The second will come when cuts to council tax benefits are also introduced. Although reform of the welfare system is a necessary undertaking, the mistake made by the coalition is to conflate this project with one of the deepest and fastest rounds of cuts ever seen in the public sector. While there are certainly savings to be made by reforming the benefits system, it's callous, callous to push through these changes at lightning speed rather than clawing back legitimate efficiency savings over a period of time. The welfare reform and local government finance bills are now in the hands of Parliament, but majority party councillors should not believe that they have no choice but to sit back and watch the borough's residents suffer the consequences. It does remain within the gift of Wandsworth Council to help the most vulnerable by creating more social housing, providing more comprehensive adult care, creating new hardship funds and lowering the rents on the properties that are already let. Instead, as the speech from Councillor Hallmark has indicated tonight, and I'm sure will be echoed in the comments that follow, councillors in the majority party not only have no plans to protect vulnerable families from the effects of these changes, but they are applauding the cuts. Combined with the Council's long-term commitment to sell off its social housing stock, replacing it only with so-called affordable housing, where rents are between 50 and 100% higher than Council rents, these welfare reforms will drive low-income families out of the borough over the next 10 years. I'm not convinced that this is a notion that every one of the majority party councillors feels comfortable with, but sadly that's where we'll find ourselves if these reforms are implemented. Before I finish, I'd just like to respond to a couple of points that Councillor Hallmark made. I think what councillors on this side of the chamber find particularly hard to, to take is the suggestion that there is uh, a lazy, workless population out there. Uh, I'm sure there are a very small minority of people who have learnt to rely on the benefit system because it didn't create the right incentives for them. But they are a minority and both parties are in agreement that we should create a welfare system that incentivises people into work. But it is an absolute mistake and an insult to suggest that most of the people who rely on the welfare state want to rely on the welfare state. They do not. And those same people who say that they welcome a cap on benefits, uh, of course, some of them have been on benefits before and have been very glad to get off them. Uh, of course, everybody wants a fair system, but I think it's insulting and simplistic to suggest that, that there's a lazy, undeserving poor, and that's what this bill is all about. So I urge councillors to vote against this paragraph this evening and the executive to reposition its response 
based on the welfare reform and local government finance bills to ensure a fair outcome for all of its residents. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Daly. Councillor Merritt. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Mayor. Can I just begin by putting on the record my gratitude that tonight we actually get to debate something as topical as welfare reform. We meet quite regularly as a full body, and although the quality of debate owes much to the high calibre of colleagues on both sides of the chamber, it's often the case that what is brought forward does not reflect the big changes that will make a real difference to the lives of ordinary residents. I think it's fair to say it's a frequent trope of political rhetoric that everyone agrees about the ends, we merely disagree about the means. In many respects, we could argue that this is true tonight about welfare reform. But for those willing to probe a bit deeper, however, it should be quickly become apparent that we badly need to challenge such assumptions. Though it's often true at the level of the discrete policy, for example, broadening access to health care, it's wrong at a deeper level of what we might call the tectonic plates that shift political battles. Reducing left-right differences to disagreements over means has a numbing effect on clear thinking. It's an obstacle to grappling with some of the larger problems that now need the sort of reform that goes far beyond the business as usual, tinkering around the edges, let left and right have con conflicting models of moral reasoning and cannot easily be synthesized or bridged. Labour, according to their leader and his welfare secretary, want reform, but then they vote against it. Anyone who has read 1984 will find this idea curiously familiar. In that particular perceptive novel, Orwell introduces the term doublethink, which he describes as the power of holding two contradictory beliefs in one's mind simultaneously. And accepting both of them, to, get any, to forget any fact that has become inconvenient, and then when it becomes necessary again, to draw back from the oblivion for just so long as it's needed. I could think of no better description, really, in some ways, for the farce in which the Labour Party for now finds itself on welfare reform. I would merely observe that by using the same dividing lines as the 1980s, it's unlikely to have a happy ending for Labour. There are, as we have seen time and time in, uh, in this chamber and elsewhere, a party short on ideas, indifferent to work, values, family, and inexplicably infatuated with higher taxes. Working people contribute to society, create the wealth, and carry the burden of taxes. They've learned and accepted the rules that govern social behavior, and they in turn expect to get a fair reward for their work and not to receive less than those who do not. Labour's huge welfare bill has failed to empower many vulnerable people, and it's not where the public are at. They want to see a direct link between contribution and reward, between effort and outcomes. It's as if the party opposite, which can rightly lay claim to some substantive achievements, will now reduce to a lobby group advocating more state spending. What about the people for whom this money is drawn? Even now, there seems scant recognition um, and, reluctant, and a great reluctance to absorb that. The rethinking for them is especially painful on issues such as public spending and, wealth and the welfare state, where Labour has always assumed, rather incorrectly, that they hold the moral high ground. Yet it's on, welfare state, on the welfare state that the most rethinking needs to be done. Whilst Ian Duncan Smith presses on, it is as though the party opposite were locked into an episode of the thick of it without the consolation of being in power. The waste of money is bad enough, but the human waste is unforgivable. The, welfare, the British welfare state has to use its own language 5.7 million clients, more than some European countries. In Glasgow, Liverpool, Birmingham, at least 20% of the population are on out-of-work benefits and were throughout the boom years. This is perhaps the most deplorable of Gordon Brown's failures. The Work and Pensions Secretary's plans to overhaul the welfare system and create a universal credit that ensures everyone is clearly better off in work. Nowhere is the cold heart of government more evident than the threat of young people on welfare. Above all, it's about fairness in the middle. With the scale of the economic challenge being what it is, this is a, a theme I'm sure we'll return to a great deal more. The next step, surely, is not to rest but to press forward 
colleagues, I would urge you to back this motion. Thank you, Councillor Moritz. Councillor Gibbons. Thank you. Um, no decent person could support the disgraceful attitude of the party opposite uh, that all of those in receipt of benefit are scroungers and this is an insult to the hard-working poor. Um, so uh, I'll try and explain to you what Labour's position is because obviously you haven't even bothered to look at what our position is. It's fairly straightforward. We support the principle of a cap on benefits but based on a regional cost of living. Most of the cost of benefit is through housing benefit, especially in London, where half of those affected by these changes live. Driving this is the high cost of rents, both council and private. Yes, this government will not consider any form of rent control, and it was a Conservative government which abolished them. They've created the problem of uh, rising benefit costs themselves, and now they're going to blame the victims of that themselves. But I actually want to look particularly at a rather particularly nasty and unfair aspect to the so-called welfare for reform proposals. And this is the inclusion of child benefit in the capped figure. There are, uh, as we've heard from Councillor, Councillor Belton, uh, 1,200 households in Wandsworth which would be affected in 2013 to 14. Across the country, 67,000 households uh, will have their benefits reduced, losing an average of about £83 a week. And that's £83 a week a family has to find to pay their rent, not to spend on food and clothing for their children. Um, and this is a particularly uh, vicious measure because it will affect 90,000 adults, but 220,000 children will be hit by this cap. Um, excluding child benefit from the cap would actually save the family with three children £47 a week in uh, the, the potential loss that they face. The majority will see their benefits reduced by the cap, but this would have gone a, a long way to mitigate the impact on children. Um, and that well-known Trotskyite, as that sad little man, Mr. Gove, would have it, uh, the Lord Bishop of Ripon and Leeds, uh, said this, uh, the cap as it stands is not just because it fails to differentiate between households with children and those without. It makes no provision for the additional cost of bringing up children, which is the purpose of our most successful and well-targeted provision of family support, that is, child benefit. Child benefit is a non-means-tested benefit paid to both working and non-working families. Removing child benefit from the cap would have also maintained the principle by which it was intended. Having children is recognised as a positive thing for society, and households, whatever their income, should be supported to provide for their children. It's unfair to punish children for the choices of their parents, the most likely consequence is that a significant increase in the number of children living in poverty. The Labour Party have promised to abolish child poverty by 2020 and the Conservative-led government appears to be intent on increase, increasing the numbers of children living in poverty. For us, a key principle of the Labour Party is fairness. Is it fair that children born into small families with earnings in excess of 80,000 a year received child benefit while those born into larger families with a benefit income of £26,000 a year do not. A household receiving, by the way, £26,000 in earnings uh, will most likely be receiving additional state benefits on top of that, including actually child benefit. What the Conservative Party is doing is playing off the have-littles against the have-nots here. Um, a fixed benefit cap set at 26,000 is nothing more than a tax on children. A household with three or more children under 18 is much more likely to be affected. The saving is very small. What exactly is the motivation? Well, it's the historic Tory project to get the poor off the backs of the rich. It's political gesturing of the nastiest sort, trying to play the haves, the have-nots against the have-littles, and the victims of this are the children. The Tories are once more the nasty party which Theresa May spent a lot of time trying to rid you of the image of, and I'm afraid you've just got it back. Thank you, Councillor Gibbons. Councillor Senior. Uh, Madam Mayor, I did wonder when we started this debate uh, exactly why the Labour Party were keen to put up so many speakers on the issue. I thought that after the embarrassment they'd suffered nationally uh, by voting against the proposal that all the opinion polls and surveys show is very popular with a huge majority of the public, they might not actually want to do that. 
So actually, it has actually been rather an interesting debate. We've covered a, a fair range of ground, it has to be said, from Keynesian economics uh, to the workhouse and back. We've had some quite outrageous things uh, said by the Labour group, including in particular the assertion that we uh, believe that every single unemployed person is deliberately avoiding trying to find work and is feckless and lazy. That most certainly is not the case. But let's look at some of the principles behind this reform. It seems to me there are three essential questions to ask. First of all, is it right there is a cap on benefits? Yes, I think it is right that we do put a cap on benefits. It, it cannot be right. Uh, that benefits uh, extend theoretically uh, to, to any degree and uh, they can get it to some extremely large amounts, way above the, 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 the wages of many hard-working people. Is it right that we choose a particular level of cap? Well, yes, I think it is. At £26,000 a year, uh, that means a pre-tax income of £35,000 a year the sort of income that will almost get you into paying higher rate tax. So we're not talking about pushing people down to a level uh, of the very poor at all. We are still proposing very substantial amounts. Should it be regionalised? Well, actually, all benefits are paid at a national level. Do we really want to think about regionalising all benefits? Perhaps an interesting idea that perhaps uh, benefits could be less in, um, say, red cars than they are in Wandsworth. Uh, but... <laughs> That, so far, has not been part of the debate. But, of course, there is one area, contrary to what Councillor Gibbons said, uh, in which there is actually a regional element, and that's in respect of the local housing allowance, where, actually, the, the levels for which local housing allowance are set uh, vary, well, not just on the borough by borough basis. In the case of Wandsworth, there are two separate bands depending on, on the particular uh, part of Wandsworth and the particular uh, locally prevailing uh, rents already. But yes, again, surely it is right there is some sort of limit on the level of local housing allowance paid. The maximum amount being paid at the moment, in one particular case, is £104,000 a year. Now, I don't want to go entirely daily mail. They should come out with these, or no doubt, the very extreme cases they, they are able to produce on a regular basis. But the fact is, it has got out of hand very large amounts, uh, and justifiably large amounts of money are being paid out. And yes, of course, who is making them? In some cases, some pretty unscrupulous private landlords. And finally, is it right that we reform, reform welfare? Well, of course it is, because we need to get away from the situation we've been talking about tonight. But in some cases, not in all cases,